we are here on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of Saints and Sinners, which is coming up in 2023, and Pride Month, it's June 2022, and the publication of Andrew Holleran's latest novel, The Kingdom of Sand, which you can get at your reliable local bookseller. So Andrew, um, you're doing press these days for the book, and I'm gonna join in asking you a few questions. We're gonna talk about the book, but I, I have some other questions. I actually have five or six hours worth, so we'll just narrow them down. No, 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 I won't ask them all. I wanna ask a few almost lightning round questions because they're things that kept crossing my mind when I was thinking about talking to you. And you can give long answers if you want, or you can just give a one word answer. Uh, do you write every day? When I'm in my groove, yes, I do. This is interrupted things, but normally I do. Do you need what I would think of as an assignment or does your day and your thinking at the moment spark the impulse to put fingers to keys or pen to paper? Both. That's a good question. Both. Do you uh, like do you like an assignment? I love an assignment. And that's, I think, why I've been writing for the Gay and Lesbian Review as long as I have. It, it's a concrete assignment. You get a book, you have a deadline, a number of words. It just orders your life and keeps you busy. Um, but the other category of writing is also uh, true. You walk out and you go to the grocery store and you see something, or you have a feeling driving home about something that you saw. And it's a kind of diary impulse that a lot of us have. And you write that down and you don't know if you'll ever use it, but it relieves something to write it down. Wonderful. And do you go back and look through those scraps and things or they are you type them up or write by hand? I write by hand on the backs of envelopes and bills and pieces of paper scattered all over the house. And that's why I'm living in, in Grey Gardens at the moment. Uh, the house is strewn with those things. Um, if I type it into the computer, it's only if it's connected to a document that's already there um, that I think will add to it. But I don't open up a new document for a little squib of something I saw at, at, when the bag boy put my groceries in the shopping cart. Right. Do you carry a notebook? That's so funny. Do you carry a gun? I don't. Um, I don't carry a notebook. Um, you know, I believe in the unconscious a great deal. And I think that if something is going to be important to you, it will enter your unconscious and it will come up later when, it, when it's relevant. I think all writers do that. Not all of them. <laughs> Edward Albee. Do you know anyone? Edward oh, Albee was a big proponent of that, saying he would he would do all the rewriting in his head, and what would come would come, and he trusted that that unconscious process. And no, I mean I don't think it's he would consider it a secret, but John Guare carries a notebook, and then all of a sudden something pops into his head, and he's writing in the notebook. Amazing. I was just about to ask you, do you know anyone who carries a notebook? <laughs> you do. Well, okay. Well, well, it works for him. I think what, exactly whatever works. Uh, do you keep a diary? I do. And it, it's been started and stopped in so many different places that I don't think I could put it together. And I don't even look at it much. Uh, but I do keep a diary. Isn't it odd? There are some things that mu that can only go on a diary, and there are other things that are these impressions that I write about on the back of envelopes, and they're not the same thing. So what is it about a diary entry? It's generally more something happened that you want to record, whereas the other category of impression is just an impression, a look, a moment. 
and and so the diary are things that wouldn't go into the fiction that per se that's correct interesting because they're to relieve me of some kind of what is the why do we write in diaries why Yes, and why do people keep notebooks? The part of the reason I ask is because there were quite a few times in the Kingdom of Sand where it felt almost like a diary, a recording of this time and this place and this period and the various incidents and relationships. And so I thought, oh, I wonder if this is, if, if, if there's any uh, meshing. It's funny. Um... Kingdom of Sand was written in a kind of controlled panic. I didn't have a structure really, and I didn't know how it was going to hang together. But at a certain point in writing, if you're lucky, everything starts to feed into the book you're working on. You can't go out of the house without something happening that you want to put in the book because your mind is so focused, I guess, on it. And you become like a little magpie. I'll, I'll use this and I'll use that. And that's what happened uh, toward the end, writing uh, that. And maybe that explains what you're talking about, that kind of uh, multiplicity of uh, impressions. Everything was, everything was honing in on the subject of death, really, at one point. And, um, and I, I couldn't stop um, it. And do you read reviews? I do not. I just don't have the nerve. <laughs> it's, it's two things. Uh, fear of reading something that is going to wound you deeply. And uh, the other fear is of becoming too self-conscious about what you do. You know, I was always fascinated by Tennessee Williams' refusal to talk about what they now call his process, that you can read the memoirs, that whole book, and you will not find one thing in it, if I'm correct, about how he wrote the plays. Because he was so protective of that mystery. That's why, that's one reason not to read reviews. And he, he well, the, he had other reasons he shouldn't have been reading reviews, but he almost, it's almost a cuff to his critics that he doesn't put anything about his process in there. And he even says- Say that again. It's almost a little tough to the critics that he he doesn't put anything in about his prof process. Oh, to you mean see? Yeah, he says somewhere in the memoirs, well, that's not interesting. You want to know about my life. <laughs> and he knows the critics would kill to know about the process. Well, yeah, and actually he, he's another one where uh, the unconscious, the unconscious not only played a role in the writing, but, and I don't know, you, I don't know you can hold his feet to the fire that he was true to this, but there are a lot of places where he, he'll say, what I'm getting at will be caught by the audience in moments and images. It's not a great theme I'm laying on top of them. He, he trusted the unconscious of the reader to absorb certain information. Huh. To not necessarily That's interesting. intellectualize it. Um, so this, I have my first question here, which you kind of answered already, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because it may relate to other work. You know, we've, we've talked for 10 minutes and I didn't mention Dancer from the Dance. Now I've spoiled it. Andrew wrote Dancer from the Dance, if you didn't know that. Um, so when you're writing fiction, um, not only Kingdom of Sand, do you tend to think first in something, in, in stories, characters, or ideas? Which is another way of saying, do you have some sense where the novel is going, or do you just take off? I just read a review of James Patterson's uh, new autobiography. James Patterson is what the best-selling writer of all time, I mean, eight hundred million dollars worth. And he said that um, 
what he tells people when they ask for advice in writing is outline, outline, outline. And I think that's probably very good advice, but I'm the opposite. I never outline and it gets me in trouble. I envy people who know where the book is going, the structure, when something will happen, when the next thing should appear, um, which is really what a novelist does when a, uh, when a novelist is writing a novel. They're, they're planning something over a space in a period of time in which events are going to lead you along. And I, I just don't think like that. I don't know how I think, if I think at all about writing that way. But I envy my friends who, who do outline and do design their books. I think it would be comforting. You'd feel secure if you knew that. And have you ever- been You know, one of the things, back to Williams, can I go back to Williams? One of the things that amazed me in the John Guar uh, biography, Mad Pilgrimage of the Flesh, was the fact that even at the point of writing Cat in a Hot Tin Roof, correct me if I'm wrong, but Williams would, write scenes and then send them over to Elia Kazan and he would say, can, can I use this? Shall we put this in? In other words, even Williams, I think, did not know always. He, that's quite true. Where things are going to fit. Yeah, and, and I think that in, in that process, for example, that those were, that's one little window into a longer process that went on with Cat for a couple years. And, and, the, and the biggest thing is that his initial play was a long one act, like Suddenly Last Summer, that he wanted to do with a smaller play. And his agent and Ilya Kazan told him, no, you have to write the whole play. <laughs> so he went back and started doing it. And that's where maybe some of that communication comes from. That's so interesting because when I finally saw Cat live at a little uh, theater in Gainesville, Florida, I was struck by the fact of how long the first act is. Is it not? It is, it is. And the structure is very, it's kind of interesting. And now we have to get off Williams. And I'm also going to, I have three comments here, which are pre probably not, they're probably violations of the interview interviewers rules, but I wanted to respond a little to the book to see what, if you had any thoughts about this. Um, I, I just, I thought it was wonderful. I, I had difficulty putting it down. And- Oh, thank you. Um, coming back to it, as I, as I mentioned, I haven't, I don't quite know how to characterize the narrator, but it, it deals with a lot of difficult subjects. As you said, it certainly deals with death um, but there's a kind of a distance or almost a reserve, I almost want to say politeness about the narrator that took me through the various scenarios, relationships, but I didn't find it sad per se or elegiac necessarily. I just was fascinated. But then when it got to the descriptions of the weather or the natural world, that's when my heart started to become a little unmoored and I was feeling what was going through this guy. And I, does that make any sense? Your reaction is just a dream come true. First of all, you said the nicest thing that any writer ever wants to hear, which is I couldn't put it down. But secondly, what you're saying now is really interesting. Ed White read the book and told me that there are only two life affirming things in it. One is the affection for Earl and the other is descriptions of nature. So the weather is, is part of that. And oh, that is terribly interesting. Um, I'm glad you found it funny too. That's very crucial. I'm not sure that everybody will. Um, the funny part was to distance the what the narrator or the book itself from the sadness of the material but the nature the weather descriptions were heartfelt <laughs> i don't know how else to put it so that's <laughs> just terribly interesting uh, 
great. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, and yes, I didn't. I didn't. Did I say it already? That was funny. I thought it was. It's very playful in places, but in a low key. You know, you you see it. Fine. You don't see it. The train's still moving. Do you know what I mean? As opposed, you can't like. It, I think witty is perhaps the best word because. If you tell somebody it's funny, they think, oh, that's a certain kind of laughing. But it isn't that. It's these observations, these calm observations. I mean, some are like a little more obvious than than others. There's a there's a certain point when um, the um, the narrator is visiting Earl and they're watching movies, and there's been a question of the awareness of the handyman to what extent he sees Earl as this that el- sees them as these elderly gay men. And he comes in and says something, and the narrator says, did he even know what he was seeing? Two gay men in love with Irene Dunn. <laughs> and you either oh, laugh at that or you don't. I find that life affirming. I, I think there was there's a lot of stuff like that in there. I'd have to go back through and pick it out, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Again, I'm in seventh heaven. I mean, uh, the distinction between funny laugh out loud one-liners, yeah, and witty is it precisely right? That's correct. Yeah, it's just. And I have no, you have no idea though how I struggled with the line about two queens in love with Irene Dunn. It was so hard to get the wording right on that. So I, and I didn't think I was making a joke, but I wanted to drive home the contrast between the handyman and the other two. Okay. You, you did, and I was going to go back and find the precise word so I could quote it properly. And of course I couldn't. Do you ever try to find, I'd have to go read the whole book again. Which all the time, all the time. Didn't have time. Now the other one, I'm going out on a limb here, I think a little bit, but, and this is why I ask you if you read the reviews because they, you, you and I think you already probably know this, but they compare Dancer from the Dance to Great Gatsby quite a bit. And they compare you to Fitzgerald. I say they, I mean reviewers, commentators, interviewers, people like this. And I don't know Gatsby quite well enough to make that connection totally. I mean, I get it in the technical sense, but I didn't quite feel it. And I'm I'm rereading. I bought this mass market paperback. I hated yeah. market paperbacks growing up. Now that's all I want. And look at that cover without a shirt. Um, <laughs> So anyway, something did come to mind while I was reading it, and it's, I don't have it perfectly formed, but it's not, I wouldn't compare you in style, I'm not comparing you to the writer, but there were several times when it made me think of James Joyce's The Dead, where in The Dead, the narrator, is seeing, for example, his wife reliving a moment from when she was a child. So he's seeing the past present, very alive and present. It's not dead, even though the people are dead. And in other moments, and this happens even more, he's, he sees the future in relationship to mortality. And he sees his one of his elderly aunts and he knows she'll be gone soon and he can see her in her coffin and that kind of thing. And this narrator is dealing with that the whole time with Earl. He's looking at his own mortality through Earl and looking back at the mortality of his family who are long gone, or I mean parents long gone. Does that make any sense? No. Thomas, you're a dream reader, I will repeat. I mean, that's wonderful. I love The Dead. And um, the book that I wrote that really is most explicitly about where are they? Where did they go? I suppose is grief. Yeah. But in a way, Kingdom of Sand to me is a continuation of grief. It's what happens when the guy gets back to Florida. And what happens is he's stuck with the memory of all these dead people. And yes, absolutely, he's totally 
explicitly conscious that in watching Earl get old and die, he's watching himself in future time. Which, There's something almost sadistic about it. Um, and and, who, does, it's, it's, and it who doesn't do it? Is there a person I'd like to know who does, hasn't had those thoughts? When they get to uh, a certain age, how can you not? Agree. Totally agree. It's, it's there. Um, so here's a, this question. I may, may or may not relate to this. Um, and I expect it comes up at all these interviews, but to what extent do you feel we're seeing your life and how fictionalized is it? I know it's fiction, but I also know there's corollaries to your life. And where do you stand on that? Or how do you address it? Or do you just let people think what they think? I think the last. Um, if you're asking about auto fiction, really, which is um, what worried me about the book. Um, I had to stop and put in things about the narrator that distinguish the narrator from me. I gave him a job in Washington, um, working for the old man who publishes books about vanished houses. I, um, what else did I do? Little things here and there that I, it was very important to me that the narrator of the book not be me, the author. <clears throat> and, um, and yet there was so much in that book that did come directly from me. I think of the writer Jeff Dyer, who wrote a book called Jeff in Venice, Death in Varanasi, about a guy over in India uh, pursuing yoga. And it's, it read to me exactly like um, real life. And um, he was asked in an interview about this, how much of, it, how much of his writing was, uh, was his own life. And he said, something along the lines of 98%, he said, but the 2% is where all the art lies. <laughs> and I thought, that's about it. You know, as long as you have some separation, it's okay. But um, auto fiction is a perilous thing. And um, I, 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 I makes me nervous. I, that makes sense to me. I, I... I didn't feel that it was 100% you, and I, I appreciate that. It's fine to see the connections, but there's some kind of transformation of an author's feelings and life that goes into fiction that allows you to take it as itself. I think if it's too close to the author, then it's distracting. You're exactly right. I mean, Gatsby, one of my favorite books, has a narrator that is obviously constructed Nick Carraway. Uh, he's hardly there, but he's witnessing everything, but it's obviously a character and it gives you a distance. And Proust is the most amazing example of this. Proust wrote a 3000 page whatever book in the I narrator. It's so close to his life. And yet at one point he says something along the lines of, Marce I'll call myself, Marcel, if that's what you would like. In other words, he never, never, ever gives the reader the impression that he's simply talking about his own life. It's all transformed. And God, it's really an achievement to do that. Anyway, so the I narrator is very, very tricky. Right. I mean, the first thing they teach you in, in writing school or MFA programs is that the I narrator must be a separate character that you, from the author yeah well and it happens all the times where they'll say oh that's his autobiographical novel or his autobiographical play or her autobiographical whatever and most of the writers find some way to to, to make some distance and this is part of why yeah, I the, the diary but i ask myself but i mean i'm drawn to autobiographical writing and yet i don't like auto fiction. So what's the magical difference? I'm, that's what we're asking now. And I, I don't know the answer. It, it appears in the writing, that's that. Um, this, this is a question that's sort of 
bleeds into what we're talking about. Uh, well, there's an aphorism that, uh, for me, uh, from E.M. Forster, that applies to a lot for me. And it's, uh, how can I tell you what I think till I see what I say? <laughs> And I'm wondering to what extent, because you're not doing outlines and setting up a structure, you're, you're working out thoughts, ideas. Do you discover what you think of something when you try to describe it? Or do you, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. And once again, you're extremely astute. I think that's exactly how I wrote this book. At certain times I would say to myself, what is this book about? Is this book about uh, death? Is this book about being a homosexual in a small town? Is this book about the experience of living in Florida? Is this book about Florida's disappearing under relentless growth? I said, why don't you pick one? And then I thought, if I do that, it will reduce the whole thing to just you know that topic. So I thought, I'm not going to know what this book is about. I'm just going to keep writing. And that's what I did. I understand. Um... Uh, another thought, and this is based on based on reviews. And fortunately, you you mentioned it at the top, is that you know because everybody they, they it's, there's nothing wrong with it. Needs sort of a sure. Well, what's that book about? And and the response has been death. The book's about death. And to some extent, that's true. But something else kept popping up for me, and I wrote. I wrote down notes. I don't usually write notes reading a book, but I did jot things down. He takes notes. Um, and that is, um, for lack of a better word, aloneness. Being alone, loneliness, apartness, being single, being a recluse, lonely in a crowd, alone together. They're all in there. And all of them are relationships with other people. What you, do you mean? Well, you can't be alone if there's not somebody to be away from. You have to. That's true. That's true. And, and that's what I was following after a while with this narrator was, okay, well, there's this friend and they talk about this and this friend, they saw each other at the, porno theater and this is the earl relationship and the family relationship and even letting the dead people in more than some of the living people or well, the relationship Which is with, what the dead is about. with the cvs workers those are all so it's not loneliness per se although he's lonely at time it's it's all these other al alone states that are at least in the book i mean you can just be alone be alone but in the book they're relative to something else they're relative to all the neighbors this guy knows have moved away and who are these strangers i'm going to stop complimenting you whenever you say something like this i'm just going to say number five Number five. What's Robert number? Farrell wrote a book, <laughs> wrote a book called The Blue, oh God, the book about Florence, where he goes around with his gay friend Chase. And whenever something impresses them, Robert simply says number five, and they don't have to explicate it. That's just so interesting. Um, and I agree with it totally. It is relative to other people. And in the opening chapter of the book, when they're talking at lunch. It's explicitly about the Japanese concept of kodokushi, which is when somebody living with the other family members or sometimes living alone um, dies and they're not discovered for several days because they have died so alone. And that's the narrator's horror. Uh, he doesn't want to have that. There's something about dying alone 
it was when, my gra- when my grandmother was in her late 70s to mid 80s, I think she died at 86. Um, she had an agreement with my mother who lived only a mile away that my mother would call once a day and my grandma would answer and she'd say, hey, she'd say, hi there, okay, bye-bye, and they'd hang up. And it was because my grandmother was terrified that she'd die and nobody would find her right away. Wow, exactly. That's that's it. That's it. Um, this question, well, maybe you can help me with it. Did Was there any, the, the biggest object or subject for the, the narrator, I think, is Earl, although all the other parts are important. Did, um, and, and the narrator kept a remove with Earl the way he kept a remove with all kinds of people. Did you ever think of crossing that boundary? Yeah, one of the things the narrator likes about Earl is that he does keep a distance. He never asks the narrator any questions about his personal life. And the narrator thinks this is an example of an old fashioned respect for privacy that has kind of vanished from American life, which I think is arguably true. Um, so the narrator likes the impersonal uh, dignity that Earl has. Um, and when it came time to create a scene between them that would cross that boundary, I usually said no. I based Earl on a real person and I thought writing it, I will not put anything in this book that he didn't do or say, because to do that would just ruin the character. Um, But there were moments in the final draft when I thought this has to be spoken. One of them is when they're in the kitchen and the narrator says to Earl, aren't you afraid of death? And Earl says no. And then the narrator gives a speech about why death is so horrible. And um, that to me was a made up uh, scene in which I broke my rule. And there were a couple of others that it seemed to me the scene just demanded speech rather than thought on the narrator's part. But um, it was very much part of Earl's character that he was reserved. Right, so they were in a, a match in some ways. They were a match. They were a match. Otherwise, they would not have been the friends they were. Yeah. They they were, and then, of course, we don't know what Earl was thinking unless, I mean, we got some idea of what he was thinking by his behavior and certainly when he said things, but we did know about the narrators doing that thing of leaving people be, be or suddenly second guessing. Well, what did that mean that lack of a phone call or not not wanting to do something or falling asleep the the narrator was always reading him as opposed to communicating with him you know okay keep going taking give me me taking taking cues based on his observations about earl and earl's behavior and what he knew of earl rather than saying earl what do you think that's true that's true and the most shocking line what go ahead the most shocking line to me is when earl again in the kitchen He's looking out the window and then he turns to the narrator and says, I've been so happy in this house. Because until then, the narrator's friend Cal has said, you know, Earl is clinically depressed and, and the narrator has often wondered how can a man be happy living alone with his dogs in a little town like this as a homosexual. So it shows that he knew nothing of Earl really. He has to take Earl at face value when Earl says that. So he understands at that moment that he hasn't understood Earl at all. And why, why the narrator has not investigated Earl more, I don't know. I guess because the reserve is a pleasure on both their sides. 
or I, the narrator is always thinking about Earl when he walks by the house. He's wondering what he's watching on television. He goes down to the front door and he looks through to see what Earl is watching on television. He um, gets back from Washington and the first thing he looks for are Earl's lights on. Is he up? Is he asleep? How is he? So it's an odd combination of being fixated on Earl and yet not wanting to violate his privacy. Yeah. I think. And that's one of those relationships that I was talking about when I said that he's he's alone or isolated or recluse, and yet he's got these relationships that are very, very clear. Um, I also think that way because of the narrator's uh, demeanor and Earl's personality, they're playing out something that happens to everybody, even if they are asking each other questions all the time and relating to one another, you still don't know necessarily what's going on with someone. Aren't you surprised by people? Yeah, absolutely. You never know. And, and the thing about manners is the downside is manners are so wonderful and I love them. But sometimes you have to read through the manners, the more well-mannered a person is, the more concealing they are. And it's like being, you know, in the State Department trying to figure out what this latest statement from Russia meant. Um, and that's, that's true of the South, I think, too. I think the South puts a great emphasis on manners. And, and yet the gap between the manners and the reality, you have to be able to recognize that. Yeah, it isn't that there isn't courtesy and everywhere to be found and that there, there is, is there is yeah. an understatement ever everywhere to be found but i've frequently thought of it as southern understatement there's a particular way of saying things but not saying them that feels sometimes unique to southern writers that's another aspect of it um I guess I talked to you about to what extent, or tell me if this is a separate subject or we just covered it, but I did think a couple times, does, is the narrator going to do or say something that will change this from a friendship to something familial? Like, like doing an extra thing, caring for him in a way and once the handyman comes along, he's off the hook. But was that ever, ever a concern or a thought? Because the family relationship is the sister and her family and the, the dead family. And that's it. But Earl's has the potential to be family in a way that friends can be familial. But it never happens. Yeah, I think that's true. In fact, early on, the narrator says that he's looking forward to helping Earl. He was going to take out his garbage and do all the things he needs to have done in return for Earl's taking care of him when he was sick that time and was living in his cottage with a cold and Earl brought him the dinner on the tray and he was so touched by that. And then the handyman appears and he realizes Earl is so old fashioned, he's not going to depend on, on the narrator. He's going to take care of it himself. And so that distances him from doing that. And he becomes jealous of the handyman um, for that reason. Um, the handyman, that's a huge yeah. issue in growing old uh, is the fear of being dependent and on whom you can be dependent. Who's going to drive you to the hospital? Who's going to discover the body? These are very practical questions. You can't get a cataract operation. You can't get any kind of operation without having someone pick you up. The hospital won't release you. So it's very practical. And the narrator, anyway, so the narrator's trips to the airport. I, again, totally practical need. Oh, perfect example. The narrator can live in Florida in this town only because he can get out periodically. And to get out, he has to fly. And to fly, he has to get to the airport. So you need somebody. 
As a friend of me uh, recently said to me, you need someone to drive you to your colonoscopy. You do. And, and also, when are you in, and, I, and again, these questions, people can always have these questions, but I feel like the, the portrait you've painted of the isolated narrator and Earl makes more of the question of when are you imposing on somebody? When are you asking too much? When are you relying on somebody you don't want to rely on? How do you navigate? And when do you have the choice? And when do you have the yeah. choice? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me see here. I have a whole, you know what? I think I want to just shift a little bit for a second and ask you about saints and sinners and your relationship to it. Um, when did you first start going, if you remember? And uh, why do you keep going? Because you go. If you <laughs> get there, you're a the question guy. I might ask. A, what? You can, might ask me as well, I know. But why do you yeah, keep yeah. going to Saints and Sinners? Okay, yeah. Well, Saints and Sinners to me is like a dream come true. And I, it's, what it, what's not to like about Saints and Sinners? You're in New Orleans, you're in that wonderful hotel, you're going to these panels, and now it's combined with the Tennessee Williams. You can go to hear John Lahr talk about his biography and wonderful stuff. It's just, hot. it's my idea of heaven. But as to how I first went and when, I can't remember. But once you go, uh, it becomes a family thing almost. You start seeing the same people the way you and I see each other. And, um, and yet there's always gonna be somebody new speaking. So you're gonna hear something you haven't heard before. And it's, it's just a wonderful, wonderful resource. I wish more people knew about it. And uh, I mean, for gay writers, it's particularly important, I'd say. Even though there are other festivals now in Provincetown and Key West and wherever. Are there other LGBTQ writers conferences? I realized the minute I said that I'm fudging, uh, there are Tennessee Williams festivals more than- Oh, Williams, yeah, there are Williams festivals. And there are, there's a there's a, a lesbian publishing weekend in Provincetown in the fall. And there's one in Palm Springs. I can't remember the- Is exact there? Name. Yeah. And- Lesbian. No, that, they, yeah, they do have speakers and they do have panels and they do have conferences. I've known people who've been on them. And so that's a, a a network that overlaps with Saints and Sinners, but as far as I know, it's unique. Um, Saints and Sinners. Yeah. 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 And, and you really are a, a star when you're there. And that's the reason I wanted to know why you keep going back. I mean, a star in the sense of a, a respected, successful writer who's there regularly. I go back, I guess, because I'm an audience member who loves this, the stuff they do. And I don't think of myself as anything else, really. I just want to, what, what's the best panel at 11 o'clock? I'm going. Um, your, your curiosity is infinite. It's something I've, I've long noticed about you. So that makes total sense. I'm always asking new questions in fact, yeah. Okay. And I'm always answering whether I know or not. Um, <laughs> so my next question, if, if you have anything to say about it, you actually mentioned it at the beginning of our conversation, is I kind of want to know about writing for the Gay and Lesbian Review. You've, you've been doing that for about 30 years, is that right? Really a long time. It's absolutely long scary. Time. And it's at least yeah. six long features or reviews a year, which is a huge contribution to that journal. And again, how many gay and lesbian writers journals are there that are, you know, have that kind of longevity? And, and what is that like? Do you know, are, you, are your communications mostly with the uh, editor publisher or do you, do you say, oh, here's something I want to write about, or do you wait for that assignment? Well, first of all, I wish more gay writers uh, did contribute to uh, the Gay and Lesbian Review, because 
at this point, it's the only game in town, in print at least. I'm, there are scholarly journals and stuff, but it's a, I, I, it's a wonderful uh, magazine, I think. What happens is every two months, the editor sends all of us a, an email, and on the email is a list of books. And I guess it's just books that publishers have sent, publishers and writers have sent to the GLR for review. And so there's a kind of uh, scramble in which you list your top three preferences and the editor parcels it out. And um, it's a gamble because you can take a terribly interesting topic like the one I just reviewed, cruising in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1895 and 1905. Oh, uh, I thought, God, does, does that interest you? Yeah, I thought this is so exotic and romantic. It hasn't come out yet, I think. Or, or, or well, I you have... know of it. Places no, no. of tenderness and heat. Oh. No, I haven't seen anyway, it. And then you read... oh, oh, and then you read the book, and it's written in this academic uh, queer theory prose that takes all the... So, and the opposite can happen. You can see an academic title that sounds dull, and it's fascinating. So it's a gamble. You never know what you're going to get until you get the book. I don't keep them but all. But it's a way to keep reading. It's a way to keep reading is the main reason I, I do it. Yeah, I don't keep them all, but I just ran across one where you're talking about a biography of Randy Schiltz. And I just want to read the book. Do you know what? Oh, that's good. Do you know what happened to me? I'm trying to downsize. I keep an apartment in Washington and I'm not there much. And I tell myself I've got to get rid of it. So last time I went up and I said, start getting rid. And I started moving the books around and, and I found this huge stack of GLRs that I really have to throw out. And instead I sat down and started reading articles in it and made no progress at all as the well, downsizing. I'll, I'll so, tell you, I don't know if this will help or not because I'm the same way. I need to keep things moving and really get, you know, tick tock. Speaking of kingdom of sand, you've got to, you, you don't want to leave a mess. And, um, G, G, the gay and lesbian, G and LR, the great thing is if you're a subscriber, the website is extremely thorough and you can search for terms, topics, subjects, books, and the reviews are all there. Oh, that's good to know. I, I rarely use the website. But that's that good way, to know. out go the, you know, it's important to read them and, you know, I love just getting the journal in the mail and reading it but you don't have to keep it because if you do want to get because you know i had that I'm, I'm a rainy day hoarder oh i'll get to that you know well i see i see so you're you're you like that feature that the digital is yeah totally accessible yeah that's how i felt with the stack uh, in washington uh two months ago i was reading issues from 2006 2009 and i thought this is good stuff um, how can I throw this out? That's the downside. <laughs> well, there you have it. Um, okay. Um, what have you been uh, reading lately? Do you, would you mind sharing with us? Can you think of whether you had to review it or Yes, not? I'd love to. There's a book that they didn't want to review because they thought it was too gossipy. And I said, send it anyway. And I've read it twice now. I'm just finishing the second time. It's a book called Capote's Women by Lawrence Lemer. And it's about the swans, Gloria Guinness and Babe Paley and Slim Keith and uh, Lee Radziwill and all of those women that he was going to write about in his novel, Answered Prayers. And he never finished Answered Prayers. Instead, he published an excerpt, two excerpts in Esquire that were so scrofulous and salacious that none of the swans, most of the swans never spoke to him again. And it caused him really to start a downward spiral into drinking and drugs that he never recovered from. It just, it killed him in a way, the ostracism. So the question is, in my mind, why couldn't Capote write answered prayers since he had always thought it was going to be his magnum opus. 
and it was coming after the success of In Cold Blood. Anyway, so it's got all this dish about the swans, about New York, about Vidal, about the, the lawsuit. Uh, it's just utterly delicious, but it is a kind of trashy, gossipy book, but smart. Well so done. I'm trying to get something out, out of that book. Uh, and, I, and it's coming to the point where it's not why Capote didn't finish Answer Prayers. It could have been he was exhausted from In Cold Blood, that he had lost interest in the swans. It could be that he didn't have the talent that Proust had to write a big epic book. He wasn't an organizer. But it also pick, paints a portrait of Capote himself and what a tough life he had um, being Truman Capote. Um, and that raises the issue of how writers like Vidal and Williams and Capote had to handle their gayness in a culture which didn't think it was such a good thing. And they each did when very, I, very differently. They're all thought of as out writers from that period, but they each dealt with it very differently. I agree with you totally. And I find that so interesting. When I was in high school, uh, Esquire magazine was a big, fat, successful magazine. And it was very literary. They published a lot of good writing. And I would go sneak off to the public library and, and pig out when there was an article about any one of the three, much less all three together. And Esquire wrote, published a lot by and about those, those men. And they were the, I didn't know I was gay, didn't know the word, but they were the icons of a life that I was drawn to. Interesting. Do you remember there were quite a few one acts by Williams published in Esquire? Every other were there really? Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. I don't know if I you can see that. Are you a television watcher much? No, that's one of the things about Kingdom of Sand. Earl watches tons of TV and the narrator has disconnected his TV. Yeah. Well, you're, just a, reads. Yeah. you're a good reader. I I don't I like I I watch to to reruns and things, but there's a, and I probably don't subscribe to the right channels, but uh, the producer, Ryan Murphy, has yeah. a sort of loose series of famous feuds. And the first one he did was Joan Crawford and Betty Davis, which I didn't see. And I, or, or partnerships, maybe. I feel like this one about Bob Fosse and Gwen Verdon was in that series. Anyway, they're doing one about Capote and all those women. Oh, you're kidding. And I, no, and I I'll wonder bet it's based, I'll bet it, if that book is involved. I'll bet it is based on that. Oh, Thomas, that makes total sense to me. Ryan Murphy has a good eye for this kind of, of stuff. It makes we, perfect sense that he We have only that. to Google to find out, I think. Okay. I will, I will, I will. Can you imagine Jesus saying that to his disciples? You have only to Google. <laughs> Okay, let's stop. <laughs> anyway, anyway, boy, you know, he has an eye for material and that is, it's fabulous material. I mean, you find out things about the fact that Jackie Onassis left nothing to Lee Radziwill in her will. Not a vase, not a lamp, as Lima puts it. That also Jack, Jackie O drove Lee to her first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting in East Hampton and sat out in the car waiting for her. I mean, little things like this, the, the viciousness and the brutality of the way the husbands treated the women was just staggering. They were all, most of them were just total egomaniacs and womanizers and, and they make gay men look chaste, these people did. The husband stealing and the husband hunting and the affairs, Pamela Harriman, let me not go on. Well, and they're already in a whole different orbit. Total because different Because orbit. of the wealth, but it sounds like you're having the same, a lot of the same husband, wife, male, female relationships in, a, in their language that were going on in the suburbs and in working class and everywhere else. They were doing their version of it. Yes, but it was totally, totally altered by the, the, the scale of the wealth and this ability, this desire to be chic. You know, one of the things the book says really almost inadvertently, no, no, it makes a point. 
the 60s is what destroyed that world. It was the, the, these, the idea of chic, of the international best dressed list of all that belonged to another kind of the United States, the 50s. The minute the 60s came in, those women knew that they were being shoved aside. They were no longer the last word in chic. You know, the thing was to come in sandals with beads and a tie dyed t shirt. <laughs> that was what a. Well, oh, I, I just also, love all this stuff. Weren't, weren't the parties that they threw, it was, oh, that black party was the 60s, but also weren't there efforts in the 70s to maintain that? By those people or different yeah, people? Yeah, throwing society parties and, and, or maybe they branched out like to Studio 54, some of them. You know, I don't know. I don't know. One of the hilarious things in the book is Joanna Capote died at Joanna Carson's house in Los Angeles. She was an ex-wife of Truman, of, of Johnny Carson, excuse me. It's a very poignant scene, but then it's followed by a comic scene in which Joanna Carson is driving around Los Angeles with an urn containing partly Truman's ashes and partly those of her last dog. And she wants to deposit them in, in a crematorium and they go to, I forget which cemetery and they're all full, but then they show her a wall in which the attendant points out that the Peter Lawford's uh, niche has not been paid for, the Kennedys have stopped paying for it. And so she takes that niche and puts Truman and the dog in that one and they scatter Peter Lawford, I think, uh, at the ocean. But it's right out of a loved one. And, are, and she are, had. Are the name of the, is the name of the dog with Truman's name on the? I that I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But Joanna Carson gave a party after Truman died, modeled on the a black and white party, thinking she would be mobbed and nobody came. I'm sure. Now, is the author of this book Lawrence Lemer? L e a m e r. Yes, He's written well, tons of books. Tracy Cunningham Googled it, I see here in the chat, and it's and the the Ryan Murphy project is based on that book. Oh, I mean, how else do we discover these things? I would did not know this. It makes total sense to me. Total sense. Thank you, Tracy. Do you like his stuff? Have you watched any of it? I, I know of these shows that I'm missing. I've only I wonder, seen I've only seen YouTube clips. It looks good to me. The American Horror Story's got a little too much for me. I did watch that Nurse Ratched, which is so violent and so dark and kind of hard not to watch. It's, um, yeah, I don't- How do you I, do it? Because you do keep, you keep up with theater, you keep up with TV and you keep up with books. It's a lot. I okay, know, moving right I, along. I don't know if I keep up that much with books. Here's a question for you. Um, and again, this is something that I have and I'm wondering, do you have some variation on it? And it's writers who make you want to write. But I just want to give an example because the writer, and this sort of bleeds over into influences, are not necessarily people you would ever imitate, write like, whose styles can be totally different, but they, instead of only being lost in the writing or enjoying it or whatever, it starts to spark the synapses. And the example I was gonna give, because there couldn't be anything more removed from me than the poetry of Robert Creeley, which I don't read very often, but when I read Robert Creeley's poetry, I wanna write. There's Robert who? Up. Creeley? Do you remember Robert Creeley? Yes, that's what I thought you said. I don't know his work at all. Why? Why no, does not asking, want to I'm not asking if, if it sparks you, but I'm saying, is there an author no. who sparks you, you, that you're reading them and you just want to put down the book and go write? Oh, that's a good question. Unfortunately, that to me is a writer you want to imitate. And that's a disaster. And the yeah. one that was that way for me for a while was Proust. He writes these unbelievably beautiful, majestic, smart sentences, and you can't imitate it. It's a disaster. I wrote I wrote a an essay called Nipples, 
for Christopher Street Magazine shortly after Dancer came out. I had a column in Christopher Street and uh, it was about nipples. And the word got back to me that John Retchie had read it and said, oh, this is just Proust on poppers. And I thought, well, I'll never write that way again. Because when you, when you read an author who inspires you or makes you want to in, uh, write, it's generally in a bad way. You, you, Henry James is the other bad influence. But the one that probably is in my bones and I can't get rid of is probably Fitzgerald. It's probably. Right. Well, and also, don't you think, though, that there may be skills and things that you pick up from these writers that don't aren't glaring, but are rather just enriching your work? Oh, for sure. You know, when people want to write, I simply want to say to them, well, read, 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 read. We're all using each other. Um, any more books you've been reading that you're excited about or that just caught your attention? Um, the Lemur, the Petersburg book. Um, oh, I've just ordered from the library because of the Lemur. I've ordered breakfast at tip. I was asked by the Times to for five books that I think are best about New York. Mm. And it really was a challenge. I thought to myself, I, The Great Gatsby was my first. And then I started Breakfast at Tiffany's, which I haven't read in a long time, and I don't know if it's any good anymore. I'm sure it is, but how I would react to that. And then I started asking friends. I was desperate. I thought, how can I have run out of them already? And um, they mentioned Bonfire of the Vanities. They mentioned the House of Mirth. And then I thought of an, another favorite of mine about New York, really, which is Bartleby the Scrivener, the Melville. So I ended up with Gatsby and, and Melville. But reading the lemur made me go to the library and order Breakfast at Tiffany's just to see how that reads now. And the other book I came upon is a book I haven't read called Furious Hours. It's by Casey Sepp, C-E-P. And it's got a long subtitle that has words like murder, death, fraud, and everything, and the last trial of Harper Lee. You know, people always wonder whether Harper Lee was working on another book or why she didn't. And it turns out that she tried to write a nonfiction uh, study of crime herself uh, based on a trial in Mississippi and she worked for it, on it for 10 years, and then she decided to abandon it. And so I've ordered Furious Hours to see what that's all about. Oh, that's the wonderful thing about reading is that books lead to other books. You know, there's a line of Henry James that relations never end. It's what you said about loneliness always being expressed with all the various relationships you have. Um, and books never end. They keep leading you on to other books. Wonderful. I love hearing That's about kind that. of good for, the, for, for this, for the saints and sinners. <laughs> well, That's I difficult. think hearing about books that excite other people, I find exciting. And also writers who you like, you want to know what are they writing, you know, reading or receiving. And that's mm -hmm, great. Mm -hmm. I love those But do you know that The what? what? The lists in the Times, they do that regularly now where they say, well, what are you reading or what are your top this or that? And I love those. Thomas, I was just going to mention that, but I find them, sometimes they're crazy. Sometimes there's a list of 20 books, not oh. one of which I've heard of, and I'm a writer and I'm thinking, where are they getting these? And it seems, to, I think a, some of them are name droppers, I think. Oh. Yeah. Not that they're famous names, but they want the more esoteric and unheard of the book, the better. I can't believe what's on some people's nightstands. But yes, I love that feature too, and I read it immediately. Have you always been a connoisseur of classic films, or or was it Earl? Not at all, and I would never, I would never offer myself as a movie maven uh, the way. When I first went to Fort Flower Island and lived in something called the Bus House, which was a place where everybody who sold 
who served drinks on the buses got to stay. I mean, I was plunged into a world in which those people knew by heart scenes from Jezebel and um, Joan Crawford movies that I thought, oh my God, what, what is this? So I've never ever been that kind of a movie maven, but it was important to me that Earl uh, choose his own movies. Someone asked me recently in an interview, why did, did you push your favorites in those lists or not? And I said, no, because they were Earl's movies, not the narrators. And it was a generational thing. So I heard of a lot of actresses and movies in going to the real life model of Earl that I'd never heard of anywhere before. On the other hand, I love movies and I miss going to movies so much now. Well, I that, haven't been to a movie theater in over two years. Well, that's understandable. Yeah, Turner Classic Movies, I'm kind of hooked on that <laughs> because I've just, it's opened up a whole new world. I, I feel like pre-cable, how did we actually see any movies on television? Because it, you had to- <laughs> Good point, I forgot that. You had to be in the right- I turned off my TV. I turned off my TV 30 years ago because of Turner Classic Movies. I was working on a novel. It was lunchtime. I got my lunch. I went into the den. I turned on the TV. I think it was The Little Foxes or something. It was some Betty Davis movie. I thought, you really have to make a decision here. You're either going to go back on the porch and try to write a novel, or you're going to watch the rest of this movie. And I thought, if that's the contest, you're going to lose. So I disconnected the cable. I never watched movies on TV again. A wise decision. Turner Classic Movies is incredible. Yeah, they're a repository. They're a library of Congress kind of thing, yeah. They certainly are. Well, I think I'm gonna, I think we'll wrap up this conversation for now. We have to wrap it up, doll. It's been oh. an hour and a half. I just looked. Oh, an hour and 10, but that's- oh, that was wonderful, that was wonderful. Perfect length. And I just realized I'm, I'm, when I'll see you next is uh, at Saints and Sinners. Right? Which is how, not that far away. Yeah. Well, God well, knows. Well, assuming yeah. that we're not having some horrible surge, things seem to be, I mean, you're in the land of the maskless and, and infected in Florida, but assuming that it's calmed down by March, let's hope it's calming down. Oh, I agree with you totally. Yeah. I agree with you. Well, Are you traveling freely now? If Are I had you traveling some, freely, if I had somewhere to go, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrew, and um, I'll see you in March. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Tracy.